Um, before we get going with these remarkable women up there, I just want to take a moment to let the audience know that what you are witnessing up here, uh, take myself out of it, is history. Never before in the history of our country of presidential <laughs> politics have the spouses from both parties, or for, from any party for that matter, gathered together to talk about their lives, to talk about the campaign trail, to talk about what it's like when someone in your family gets up and runs for president. So I, I want you to understand the magnitude of what you're seeing and the magnitude of each of these women who have taken uh, the time out of their day to be here. They are crisscrossing this country on behalf of this country. And I think on behalf of these 14,000 women, we welcome you to California and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for coming. Yeah, scooch in, scooch in. No one's sitting, no one's coming in between you. Know? <laughs> Anyway, we only have an hour, and Michelle, when she called me, she goes, do you think you're actually going to get us to be able to talk in an hour? I want to start with you of because, course. of course, that, um, your husband was really vocal about saying that you didn't want him to run, and he had to convince you, otherwise he couldn't get into this race. Right. What were you afraid of? I, I have a feeling about being reluctant, um, but w what did you fear? What did you think was going to happen, and were your fears founded? You know, I, th I think that you always worry about uh, your life getting sucked out from under you, you know, and, and there's also the part of you that is, you know, it can be a bit cynical about politics. I mean, I worry about whether politics is, can be nurturing of somebody who's decent and kind. I mean, there's always been a bit of hesitation on my part. Um, you know, I, I always joked and said there's a more sane way to earn a living. Don't do it. <laughs> Teach. <laughs> do something fun. Um, but for me, it's a, it, it, it was always thinking about the practical elements. Um, how are we going to make sure that our kids were solid? You know, how are we going to structure this? I mean, I'm very practical. I have to know how is this going to play out. You know, Barack is like, let's do it. And I'm like, well, what about school? What about... So there are a lot of practical considerations that we had to go through. And I had to know that we were thinking this thing through uh, in a way that would would ensure that our family would stay grounded and stable through the process. Were your fears well founded? Has your family stayed grounded through the process? You know, I have been um, pleasantly surprised. I mean, our girls, you know, we have nine and six year olds and they uh, have just been phenomenal throughout this. I think, you know, what you find is that the kids are the ones who transition the easiest. I mean, you know, their, their main concern about this whole race was whether or not they could get a dog. That was the bargaining chip. I was like, you want to run for president? We're getting a dog. And let me tell you, we talk about this dog every day. Every day. What kind are we going to get? You do know we're getting it. What breed? How big? How small? Yesterday morning, we talked about names. I said, look, you're getting the dog. Just, just knock it off. Right, now let it run. <laughs> Elizabeth and Cindy, you've been through this process one time before, and it, yet it seems to me, and I think to so many other people, that there's more attention this time out to the spouse, to the political partner. Is that in our imagination, or do you feel a difference this time out? I guess we get more questions about that issue, but what we do day to day really hasn't changed that much. It hasn't changed for me, except Cindy and I will both tell uh, Michelle that we both ended up with more animals last time, and we have more animals yet today. <laughs> we already have two new dogs so far this year. <laughs> A lot of bribery going on. Out there. But does it feel different this time out? Do you get a sense that there's more interest in what you're doing in your role? Do you have more to do? I, I think there's a great deal more interest this time, and I'm not sure why. I don't know if you agree. <clears throat> but I have found people seeking, seeking me out to talk specifically about what my role would be or would not be, and specifically wanting to know what my interests were. Normally, in, at least last time out, I was a little more behind the scenes and just kind of in the background. Um, I think there's an interest for a lot of reasons. I mean, there, people are more curious about the family as a whole and what you do and how you work together. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if you agree on that, but I think it, it's. I, th I also think it's a it, it's a good thing because I think people should get to know the family as a whole. 
did, w there is a lot of different debate about what is the right role for a political partner who really is, and I call this architect of change. You women really are architects of change in the way you're conducting yourselves on this campaign. And how do you figure out this is the role for me? Do you have your own schedule, your own staff? Do you campaign on your own or do you see and you get involved in the process of the actual campaign? Before I answer that, I noticed when I looked at the screen that it had Ann Romney under Cindy's name. Our husbands might be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe someone ought to fix that. And or, or we'll be, <laughs> or we'll be going home. Mary Elizabeth Cindy. <laughs> or we'll be going home to the wrong husbands tonight. So, um, you know, it's it, you, you. You wonder before you get into this. I wondered, you know, what was it going to be like? I was curious. What What does it mean? Um, and then you start in getting asked to do things, and you're asked to speak, and you're asked to represent your husband and you're doing all these things and you're, you're surprised by how much you're asked to go speak and do all these different things. So I do get involved in my schedule. I do want to know where I'm going. I, I do want, you know, to have input. Um, I don't have input on strategy or any, any of the messaging or anything like that. And I think, Elizabeth, you and I know too, it's like it, sometimes we say things and it's like someone thinks that they put those words in our mouth. It's like, no, no, it's just coming from here. And, um, and that's just, you know, you have to be who you are and you have to have the flexibility and the luxury of expressing yourself um, for who we are as individuals. And the other thing that I think is important, and I'm, I'm sure all the wives agree with this one too, is we have to let people know another side of our husbands. And sometimes politics makes it very difficult for people to get to know the personal side and the wonderful things about these men that are all running. And that's, I think, the role that we can uniquely play. Anne was just saying that she doesn't get involved in day-to-day -day strategy. Jerry, a lot has been written about you getting involved in day-to-day -day strategy. I've read everything from you're the campaign mastermind, you're the campaign strategist, you're the trophy wife, you're, you're everything. Which is the right depiction of you, do you think? Because I think most people don't know that much about you. You're the new kid on the block, so to speak. First off, this is amazing to be here. <laughs> I just, I just, it's amazing to look at and see everybody here and all these great guests. I have a one-year-old. Uh, actually, he'll be one on Thursday. Bravo. And I think most of you all know how much um, time and effort uh, that takes to make sure you've got the diapers and the food right and that you're trying to get him to sleep on time. And I also have a four-year-old. That's my main role. Uh, other than that, I do what I can to help him when he asks me. But um, I, I'm, I'm not even qualified enough to do any of the other stuff. Mostly, I'm just trying really hard to keep the kids on schedule. Well, that's not true. You're not qualified. You've had a professional life. You've been involved in politics. And by all accounts, you're in there, and you're a strategist, and you're making your opinion heard. Isn't that a good thing? Oh, I think it's a great thing, and just like we've all been talking about, I mean, we know our husbands best, so, you know, we ought to be able to say, I think this makes sense for him, or it doesn't make sense to do it this way, in terms of how it applies to the family, or how it applies to how we know, you know, he might want something. But as far as overall strategy, no, I, I, don't, I don't think I am. Elizabeth, you do, don't you? You've been quite open about that. Well, no, there, actually, there's a lot, and just like with Jerry, I think there's, anytime you say anything, as Anne was saying, it gets exploded into, into, uh, into a bigger story. Uh, we do know our husbands best. Sometimes if we think he's being misrepresented or misserved by something, it's our jobs as wives uh, to say, you know, I don't think that's really the best thing. That, that becomes, if you've spoken to the, said that to the wrong person, that becomes you are masterminding the campaign just because you were being the kind of spouse all of us hope to have. Uh, someone who's going to protect, uh, protect, protect you. Sometimes your schedule, uh, you know, as certainly as uh, we, I think are all of us are parents, and uh, you know, you need to you need to do that to make certain there's nobody advocating for your children in that schedule uh, unless you are the person advocating for them. Uh, so you have some roles, but truthfully, in truth, I think it's overplayed. Women have had spouses. The role have of had, strategist is overplayed. It's completely overplayed because you I mean you're, all you're doing is expressing. Um, what you think is best for your spouse as a spouse, not necessarily as a candidate. This is, as a man, I think that um, an advertisement that shows him in a dark room when he's really a sunny kind of guy doesn't accurately reflect him. 
if that becomes your micromanaging the campaign, then so be it. You know, you have to, you just have to do as Ann said, say what's in your heart, let the chips fall where they may, and just do the best job you can. But this role isn't really new. I mean, Betty Ford came out and spoke right. a lot. Um, we had lunch with uh, Rosalind Carter, and she talked about sitting in uh, rooms in Iowa talking about the price of fertilizer. Uh, and, and women have, have campaigned, uh, spouses have campaigned over a period of time doing just exactly the kinds of things we're doing. Now there are more of us. There are a lot of us this year. Yeah. <laughs> but there are more of us out there doing it, so, and I think it gets a lot more attention. And, you know, I, I feel like that Sesame Street thing, you know, where you have all these, every, everybody is so beautiful, and, you know, you know, which one doesn't belong? <laughs> I feel a little bit like, <laughs> a little bit like that. <laughs> a little bit like that. But, 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 but it's an extra, this is an extraordinary group of women, you it, know, it not really just is. extraordinarily talented, extraordinarily intelligent, Oh, but also, really, look, extraordinarily beautiful. Do you well, think... One, w go ahead, Michelle. One of the things I was um, thinking, I, what I find, I think the reason, one of the reasons why people are so fascinated, I think in particularly women, is um, because I think we're all struggling with this notion of balance. You know, and I think that we are the public representation of the challenges that we are all facing. I mean, when I go to Iowa or New Hampshire, the first question is, how are you managing? How are you staying grounded? How are you keeping it together? Um, and I think that that's what all of us as, as women are trying to figure out because we're juggling and we're challenged and we're overworked and we're overscheduled and we're get, not getting the support that we need. And there's a part of me that feels that it's very therapeutic to be out on the road to talk to women to say, hey, you're not crazy. This is hard. Uh, and if I'm struggling, how on earth are nurses and bus drivers and how are regular folks doing it who don't have a mother who's uh, five minutes away and the resources, you know, our, our communities are, are drowning at some level. And I think we are, they're fascinated at how we're managing. So I, I, I'd love to say something about this too, because I wonder if Elizabeth has thought these thoughts as well is when you think of all that women have to do, and they basically keep everybody happy. And I don't care if you're in a professional relationship with your, you know, your, know your husband's gonna be helping out and everything. The woman always ends up doing more. I'm sorry, that doesn't work. <laughs> it's, 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 it's five the way. Boys. Raise five boys. Five Not boys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you, you know that it's just there are so much that so much that falls on women's shoulders. They're trying to keep, as Elizabeth is now, elderly parents. You've got teenage children. You're trying to work. You're trying to keep everybody. You're trying to keep food. You're trying to clean the house. All of these things take an enormous toll on us. And I personally believe that you know, I've been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Elizabeth has breast cancer. That. At some point, our bodies as women finally say, uncle. That's right. And there's a weakness or something that happens. And you'll find so many women have autoimmune diseases. Yeah. But I truly believe because we are juggling so many balls all the time and keeping it together for everybody yeah. that we forget to take care of ourselves. Absolutely. And yeah. what, what is the, because it, Michelle, you were saying when you're out on the road, people say to you, how do you keep it together? And you say that we always forget about ourselves. Where do you draw the line? What do you say, I'm not going to talk about this, I'm not going to divulge that, I'm not going to give it up. Even though everybody's interested in every part of my life, that's too much of a cost. I've got one. Go. They asked me on the announcement too. My husband's been in the race for eight weeks, so I have a lot to learn. Um, from everybody here. But they wanted me to go on the campaign bus and they said there wasn't any room for the changing table. Oh. And you can't, I mean, it, you know, if you're, think about if you're on the road, how are you going to do that without perhaps spilling the baby on the floor? So they had, they, when they designed the bus, they had to design it with, and that's where I drew the, that was the first line. It was, that we can't, I'm not going unless you figure out how to, to do the changing table on the bus. And you know what? They did it. <laughs> But is there a line where you say, this is as far as I'm going to go. I'm no, not going to spend I, every single day doing this. I'm not going to let you know everything about my life, everything about my children. I'm not going to give everything over to this campaign. You, you want to keep your privacy, and yet you know that sometimes when you take this on, you're going to lose your privacy. 
And, um, and yet that's kind of, it, it is a balancing act and you don't want people asking all the personal questions or delving into your lives that much. You want to hold something back. For me, I don't know, the hardest part is wanting to protect my husband from the, the time constraints. And I know you said, you know, I, I weigh in all the time, by the way, at the campaign, and nobody listens to me. I'm like, <laughs> will you have your hand if that's true? Yeah, I mean, it's like, oh, come on. Are you saying nobody listens to any of you? No, when I say, don't work him so hard. Look at the schedule. You're killing the man. And I'm like, well, but, you know, and they say, yeah, 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 you're right. And then nothing changes. <laughs> it's like, so you, you do weigh in. I'm sure it's the case with all of you where we're weighing in on our husband's schedules and we're saying, please, somebody listen to me and, and fix this. And, and it never does get fixed. So there's, you know, those, those things you, you know are, um, are things you just have to live with when you're on the campaign trail. Maria, you're asking about privacy, though. And the truth of the matter is, you know, whichever of the women up here uh, spouse is successful, uh, our life is then going to be an open book. You might as well start practicing now, you know, on that mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, of being willing to uh, let people embrace you. Most of the attention you get, honestly, is good. You know, there is not to say there's not bad attention. Most of the attention you get is actually really affirming yeah. uh, for you and for your family and for the, your spouse. And, uh, and I think accepting it actually is what makes it possible to do this job. To go out day after day, you know, five events, five or six days a week. I can do that if during those events I'm getting that affirmation. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that the closer you draw the line to you in terms of how circumspect you want to be, the less you're able to do your job, which is to be a window into your spouse and their values. You know, you've got to, you, you have to open the window, you know, or pull back the curtains or whatever the remainder of that metaphor would be to let people see what it is you hope they will see. Go ahead. For me it's really been um, keeping our children's lives as normal as possible. That's been sort of a clear boundary that I think our staff has really respected. You know, part of getting into this, you know, what I've said was, you know, Barack, you have to be a good father in addition to being a good president. Uh, and you can do both. We can do that. Um, but that means that we make accommodations. So, for example, I usually travel just during the day, during the weekdays, day trips. I get up in the morning. I get the kids ready. I go on the road. I do a set of events, and I'm back by the time the kids go to bed. Now, that wears me out a little bit, but for them, they don't care where I went. You know, They, they could care less. I was home to read that, that bedtime story, and for my children, that's important for them to stay in their worlds. And I found that, you know, when you are really clear about what's important to you and you express that, mm -hmm. you know, I don't care who it is, whether it's the staff or whether it's your employers at work, you know, we, we've got to start creating those boundaries for ourselves and our families so that there's some layer of protection, even for the President of the United States. My, my boundaries changed from 2000 to this race. In 2000, I found myself much more open and much more willing to expose or to whatever, you know, Divulge. to kind of lay it on the line. Uh, since 2000, I think I've changed. I think I'm more comfortable in my skin politically and just everything. But I have now myself learned to say no. And I, my family has changed. and and you know where, what my children are doing and where everything has taken us and for me it's just the opposite now and I have I've, I've made a conscious decision to just say at some point enough and I love what my husband does I love meeting people I love going out and being part of the process but for me there comes a time you just have to stop because otherwise I can't protect my children or my home life and so I, I think it just I think it works, I think it's individual for each person and each family. When President Clinton ran the first time, as we all know, he said, vote for me, you get two for the price of one. Do you think that the American public votes for two, wants two? Do you think that they're voting for a couple or are they voting strictly for the candidate? I hope they're voting strictly for the candidate. So what is your relevance? Yeah, I, it's, it's actually an issue I, I struggle with all the time, and that is what use am I to the campaign? You know, if I'm going to spend time away from my children, um, then I need that to have a value. And so what is, evaluating what that value is, is really difficult. And that's why when I go out, I actually try to talk about policies and, and, and be a good surrogate 
um, in that way. Um, and to try to make the most difference, to try to convince people to go listen to him speak because he's the person who has to make the final sale. It doesn't matter how much anyone likes us and uh, isn't this a likable group of women, but you know, it, does, it honestly doesn't matter because we won't be the decision makers. Um, they need, you have they, influence with the decision maker. You really think it doesn't matter at all who someone's married to? I suppose if somebody were married to somebody, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, more on the negative side, honestly, than the positive side. <laughs> You know, if somebody were married to someone, who, who, I mean, you thought that was going to be a really dreadful influence. But most of the people on this on this panel share the vision that their husbands uh, have, and you know, I, I think so. I don't. It's not like they're going to be at, at war with them. I, I expect that to be the case. I don't know for certain. I think it's a fine line. Yeah. I think the American people, in my opinion, I think the American people truly are take this in the right word, electing both people, but not, for, from the spouse standpoint, not in a position of, of leadership or, or decision making on that, but they do, I believe, look at both of you very carefully and your families, because at least in my experience through the years, I, I, people say, you know, I, I, I like the way both of you look, you know, I like the way you act together, you know, I like, or whatever they may feel, and different parts of the country offer different different suggestions to so all of us. That's because it tells them something about him. Yes, yeah. You know, the relationship that he has with, with, uh, with his family, you know, the extent to which he is the, the good father, you know, the coaches soccer, plays with them, those kinds of things, and engaged with, and, or, and the relationship he has with his spouse tells them something about him. But, but doesn't it also tell you something about the spouse when you see a spouse? Like you've taken some different uh, viewpoints than your husband on certain issues. You came out in favor of same-sex marriage. Your husband is not in favor of that. And so people might get an idea, okay, this is a man who respects a different point of view. Oh, there are different points of view in that house. She might influence him. She might not. I have so far. You haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you've influenced This is not a new opinion of mine, so, you know. But, uh, have you influenced your husbands, any of you, on an issue that you feel you've brought to the table, you've convinced him that you were right and he's taken the position? Yeah, for, for us, you know, and I don't see this any different than our, our careers as, as they've evolved. I mean, I've always had a career, he's always had a career. Um, you know, in any marriage, you come together and you talk about the issues that you care about and you share those thoughts. Um, but in the end, I go to my job and I make decisions on my job. <laughs> and those are my decisions. And he goes to his job and he makes the decisions on, on his job. Now, I would like to think that he would have the good sense to understand that usually I am correct. <laughs> <laughs> but in no way do I expect it. <laughs> my husband lives in Washington, and I stayed out west with the kids. I raised all four kids out in Arizona and came mainly as a tourist to Washington. And I'll be real honest with you, by the time he got home on Friday, the last thing I was going to do was talk about issues with him. I had, you know, I had kids climbing the walls. I needed, I needed his help in other ways. So. In our house, we certainly have discussed the issues, but I don't believe I've ever influenced a change in a decision because it's, that's his it's job. It's so fascinating. Really, yeah. really it's, it's, um, it's a wonderful opportunity to be close to those kinds of decisions that are being made and policy that is being made. And I loved, you know, for instance, in, in Massachusetts when Mitt was um, trying to figure out how to get everyone health coverage. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those things where I loved being peripherally involved where you're understanding the conflict and all that's going on and understanding the issue and it's it's interesting from my perspective it's educational to learn about all these different things and to understand how difficult it is to have an idea and then to get it all the way through and passed as law those things are very interesting and they're and they're wonderful um, and I feel like we're privileged to be a part of that but it's not like you're sitting in on all of the policy meetings I feel like I'm I'm sitting maybe beside some of the policy meetings, which means, I, for some ways, it's the, it's the best of two worlds. Do you think you'd be welcomed in the policy meetings? Well, you know, you, you drift in and out, and, and, you, and you obviously have an opinion on certain things, and you weigh in when you feel like it's important, but it's not like you feel like you're there in the chair making important decisions. I've seen it as governor, and I've seen how that works. 
I am um, interested, I'm, I'm curious, I, I want to know all of the process that's going through with um, trying to figure out how difficult it is to bring down health care costs and to, and to get people insured and all of these things. It's, it's, you, you're very interested in it, but I'm not going to be the one that's going to have to be in the chair and make tough decisions. And you, we, we support them in, in those things that they have to struggle through. And we're there as a support as well when they end up being criticized for the tough decisions that they have to make. Tony Blair spoke this morning and, uh, and I thought a very revealing interview and uh, Tom Friedman asked him what was the best part of uh, what his, the best advice his wife gave to him while he was prime minister and he said that the thing that she gave him that was that he found the most helpful was that when he got down when he felt he was beaten to a pulp and that he couldn't go on she was there to lift him up buck up, get out there, this is a volunteer job, she would say to him, you volunteered for this, go out and do it, you're there. I assume all of you are doing that. Who's doing it for you? I have my boys. Your my boys. boys call me all the time, they email me every day, they call me almost every day. Your boys do my that? My five boys. Where are my boys? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I love, I mean, I have five wonderful sons. They're all adults now. They're married. And I think they are very grateful that their dad's out there doing this. And they also understand how difficult it is for me. And so they call me. Um, they're great. They're, they're there for me. It's, it's really terrific. I, unfortunately, have lost both my parents. And that would be, obviously, who would be supporting supporting us and now you know as we get older those we, we go through those struggles as well but it's it's great to get the phone call and the pat on the back and you have friends too um, you have friends I have friends they'll email me I mean I have friends that email me every single day um, and you just it just means the world to you Michelle who's there for you to say it's not as bad as you think you know, I, I think it's it's Marion Robinson in my ear my mother you know I hear don't sweat the small stuff Get up, get over it, you know. He's a good man, don't be mad at him. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> now, my mom is, uh, is a huge support for me. Um, you know, she's with the kids right now, just retired, 70 years old. Um, you know, I have this really great community of uh, women, uh, primarily. My mother, the girl's godparents, girlfriends, parents in the kids class, you know, I'm always the one they give plates to for the potluck assignment. It's like, don't assign me the main dish, please. I don't have time to cook. <laughs> so they, ha they have my back on that one. <laughs> Jerry, who, who's there for you? Fred. Fred. He wow. really, he really, really is. He's been in politics before and I haven't. Like this, with this amount of exposure, I mean, I've likened it to walking down the street with no clothes on. It's essentially, I mean, emotionally and, 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 and all the other ways. And uh, he, he has been there for me. And it's, it's already deepened our marriage just in the short time that we have done this. And I think to answer your question from earlier, I think the, in, the intense interest in the spouse this time around might be because I think people are seeing for the first time the bone-crushing pressure. You, you can see President's age in front of our very eyes. And I, I think that, that that part, who will be there to support him? Will he have the support system that he needs? And what kind of person, you know, does the relationship reflect on him? I think is, I think is, it's a little Purian interest there, of course, but um, I think that's why people care so much. You say you're a newcomer. Are you scared? Absolutely. Absolutely. What are you scared of? Um, mostly overexposure. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I, I'm scared that I'm going to miss something with my children right now, that I'll feel guilty that I'm not. And I, and I know that I'm no different than any of my friends. And what, people will call and say, well, what are you doing now? And it looks so glamorous. And I'm in my pajamas. My hair's in a clip. I've got Sammy on my lap. I've got the computer. With, and there's a syrup bottle, and it's 11 o'clock in the morning. And you sort of look around and think, I'm not really doing anything different. It might just My dry cleaning bills are more expensive now. Then, you know, and, it's, and that's sort of the transition I'm, I'm, I'm having a little bit of a hard time making, frankly. But are you afraid of messing up in front of the world? I'm afraid of embarrassing Fred. That would be my biggest fear, is not doing the right thing that, you know, I would, I would be terrified of hurting him. 
that it would, be, it would break my heart. It would break everybody's heart. I mean, all the hard work that everyone does, you don't want to let anybody down. No one pays that much attention to us. Well, that'd be good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Elizabeth, who's there for you and Cindy? Who's there to, to build you up? Well, I mean, like Anne, I have a 25-year-old daughter who is an enormous support to me. But honestly, you know, she's got her own life. Um, she's in law school and doing legal aid like Michelle did and, and, and busy. And uh, so... And based on all the trials we've been through, you know, particularly uh, with Wade and then the breast cancer, John's been the person who's been there for me, and that's still the case. We, I, you know, even when we're on the road, different parts of the the uh, country, uh, we're on the phone to each other several times a day. You know, I, he spoke, he called me right before this, right before I came over to do this. How did it go? <laughs> so, I haven't done it yet, hun. <laughs> But you know, but but it's it's that const, it's constantly knowing that he's going to be at the other end of the phone and eventually on the other side of the bed. Um, that that gives me <laughs> Sunday night uh, on the other side of the bed. Um, that uh, that keeps me going, makes it makes it easier. It gives me somebody to vent to because there's a lot of venting that you need to do. Um, you know, sometimes it's because the schedule isn't what you want. Sometimes it's that you think you didn't do very well and you and you you, you need to. You know, say I, I, I'm sorry. I just feel like I just didn't do well. You just you need somebody you write to, that you can express yourself to. Do you feel there's something you haven't done well this time out? Oh yeah. No, no. There's lots of times I've uh, you know, where I've, I've said something perhaps that was you know if it ended up on the front page of Drudge, I didn't say it right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we don't want to do. Right. Exactly. right. And I'm like, great, I'm not in there. Yeah, <laughs> not exactly there. right. That's a successful day. <laughs> and Cindy, who, who's there for you? Oh, absolutely, my husband, John. I, it, it, what I have found and through this process is the absolute wonder and beauty of what this has done for our relationship through the years. Because it, in the bottom, you know, in the absolute end, it's just the two of us. I mean, it's the two of us that are out here doing this. We have our family and everybody else and staff, but it's the two of us. And consequently, we're close friends. We're, we're our, we are our worst critics and our best friends. And uh, the one person, I, 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 he advises me on everything, and I advise him on everything. And, and I'm not talking policy or anything else, but you need a friend. You need a booster. And he is definitely there for me. And I keep a long list. You know, I have a grudge list. And he's taught me to leave my grudge list behind and give forgiveness. So that's, that's been a good thing. He owes me. That's what they were all talking about when we, before we came out here. He owes us. Big, we've all got a list, and it's not a dog on the list. It's gonna be, it's, and for me, you know, with my, with my horses, it's going to be like, you know, it's time to clean the stalls or something. I'll find something good for him to do. But everybody here really put their own individual lives and their own dreams on hold. Uh, to go out and be a political partner, a chief surrogate, uh, the spouse, whatever you want to call it. What are the dreams you feel you put on hold and does that create any resentment in you and do you think your husband would do the same for you? We bought um, some farmland uh, in, outside Chapel Hill, North Carolina and I had this idea that I was going to create paths all through the woods that as I grew older We'd walk together hand in hand, and you know, looking looking like a pharmaceutical commercial. I'm certain. <laughs> <laughs> no bathtubs will be any place, but you know, aside from that. <laughs> and I had this idea that that's you know that's what I was going to do. I was going to plant little special places, you know, put a bench some unexpected place, and I'm not doing that. Truth is, with my cancer diagnosis, I really can't do it. I have a great blessing, and that is a young man who's now a Navy, training to be a Navy pilot, came to our house and did it for us as, as a gift. Uh, so now all I have to do is, is find the bench and, and plant um, uh, daffodils in the woods and places. Uh, so a lot of that, a lot of what I'd hoped to do uh, as I grew older, I'm going to get a chance. Uh, I'm going to get a chance to do on a. Uh, but John didn't take it away from me. Um, 
you know, fate took it away from me. And so I don't think that I'm going to come out of this, no matter how it turns out, with some grudge, you know. It doesn't mean I'm not going to put him to work, but, 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 but I don't feel like I've given anything up. And look what we've gotten in return. I, I mean, I, the great gift the, of what we've gotten in return. That's the flip side of it, is that it's, all of us share this extraordinary opportunity. And I tell people when I speak, everywhere I go, I wish I could take you with me, yeah. stick you in my pocket, let you go and see what it's like to go to Iowa, to go to New Hampshire, to go to South Carolina, to Florida, to California, to Alabama. Wherever you go, you see the heart of the American people and the heart is good. And that is so confirming for what we're doing and why we're doing it. It's temporary. Whatever we're doing, it's, look, some of us aren't going to be here in January, February. You know, it's temp this is temporary for so many of us. And yet it's an extraordinary opportunity for us to see things and to see the country, but more importantly, to see the heart of the American people. And it has been, I wouldn't have traded this for, you give up a lot, but you get so much back. Well, I, I absolutely you know, agree. And for me, you know, uh, this is, it is a moment in time. Um, and, you know, it's not like I'm sitting on the couch eating bonbons, not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, but this is pretty exciting, you know. It's an amazing opportunity. Um, it's, it's a great learning experience for our daughters. Um, it is affirming in a way uh, that, that is a surprise. Um, I know that Barack always says that, you know, the American people down at their core are decent. Uh, and the, the trouble that we have in this country is that we don't get to see one another. We don't get to see that decency. We are isolated sometimes by fear, sometimes by ignorance, um, sometimes by resources. We just don't get to move into each other's hearts and into each other's communities. And we don't see that there is a lot more that unites us than divides us. I don't care Amen. what race or political party or sexual orientation, I don't care. We have a basic connection around a set of values here in this country. Decency, honesty, truth matters. That's still what's motivating the American people out there, regular folks tr just trying to get by. And to be reminded of that and to have the passion to make that everybody's reality, to offer that up to our children, you know, that's a privilege, privilege. You know, yeah. All of you are such extraordinary women, and you talk about this as really a privilege that you're getting out there and meeting the American people, seeing for yourself, being touched by them. Uh, you're touching them, they're touching you. And yet, I think we live in a time where people don't respect political leaders, people make fun of them. They don't look at it as a profession the way they did perhaps 30 or 40 years ago. Why do you think that is, and how can we change that? People nowadays, you, if you look at the Congress as a whole, there's corruption. There's, there's the ideals, the leaders that were elected and are elected uh, have lost their way in many cases. Uh, I think our husbands, I have always looked to my husband to not only be better, but to inspire people. And I, I, I think for the most part, Congress has let the American people down. And I think... If, I. I think, if, I think if any one of us would have the opportunity to step into the White House and occupy that particular position, um, it is our duty and our job to inspire and to be better and to, and to do what's right and most importantly, bring young people along and make them want to be a part of the process instead of hating the process and looking at it in disgust. It's my favorite thing on the campaign trail to see um, children in the audience, and I usually try to single them out and, and say, your parents brought you here, I know that. You didn't come here of your own free will, probably. But this is extraordinary, what you're doing, is sitting in this audience and listening to people that want to be President of the United States. And you're learning something by being here. You're learning that your parents care about this country. And you're learning what it's like to get to know a person firsthand and to make your own decisions about things and that's so important and it is such an extraordinary country so I get inspired when I go out and I see um, young children that are in the audience or then I see uh, it, the young active kids that are teenagers or high school or college age kids 
I love that when I see that. There's not enough of that. I do know that. Um, we do have to, again, I think, inspire and lift and let people re remind them of what an extraordinary nation this is. We are the hope of the world still. We are the freest land in the world. And we have to preserve that liberty and we have to preserve that love of country because I believe America is great because of the people that are in, in this nation are so wonderful themselves. And we have to remind each other a little bit more of how wonderful this country is. You've all seen, beautifully said, this, this process, process up close. What's the one thing you could change about running for president of the United States if you could today? Elizabeth. Uh, one, I, I do one-on-one -on -one interviews with every American, you know, honestly, if you could. If you could see the value in that, because what, you, what you're trying to build with each voter is a trust relationship. It's really hard to do over a television set, um, or hard to do, even you know, as wonderful as it is here in a crowd like this. Uh, you need to build that trust relationship, and then, honestly, you need to rebuild it every day. Um, but you need, but this, when people say it's wonderful to be in Iowa or New Hampshire or Nevada or South Carolina, what they're talking about is having, being able to look somebody in the eye and earn their trust. That's why what we do, sometimes it seems like well, we go and it seems we're just enjoying the ride. We have an important responsibility, and that is building, helping build that trust um, uh, for our spouses. And if we, it, that's the way it ought to work. There's no chance of it's working that way. But you know, to go back to sort of the old democratic ideal, if you could change one thing, I'd say it was a job interview with each individual American. And I'd probably each one of us would say, oh, and then we'd all trust the result. You know? <laughs> so, what would you do? Would you take the fundraising out? Would oh, you shorten I, the process? Oh, yeah. I wish you, yes, you wish absolutely. you could get the money out of, out the, of it. Out of it. it. It's, you, you know, you, you wish that's, that would... It's very hard to spend most of your time just fundraising. It's just really, really frustrating to have that part um, be so important, important part of the piece. You wish you could get that out. But, you know, we can do that, you know? I mean, that's, you know, that's another thing. We can get Congress to really think critically about campaign fund. That's on us. Right. You know, we can change that part of the process, but it's a huge distraction, you know, and you have to have the money to, to, to get seen. Um, so, you know, that's something. I would also, you know, stop this sort of pontificating um, and the polling and the, you know, so uh, early in the process um, so that people can actually listen and be open-minded and make decisions um, at the polling place after they've factored in everything. I think, you know, we, we do that every year, you know, we call it and we, you know, say who's in and who's out and people don't know what to think and they're not paying attention. You know, that interferes in my view with the democratic process of listening and learning and being open-minded and discussing the issues and learning the candidates. So would you shorten the process? You know, I, I don't think it's the, the time length. I think you take money out of it and, you, you know, you, you give people the opportunity to travel the country and talk to people. You know, I think that's what, you know, folks, folks need to build that trust. They need to get exposure. Um, and uh, unfortunately, right now in the process, we've got, and it, it, it's a good process that we've got really strong early states who get to really see and feel and understand the candidates. But, you know, it would be nice if that, uh, opportunity were available to everyone, yeah. you know, um, right. in the country. It's, it's, yeah. it's interesting what's happening with the rest of the um, other states pulling up, you know, earlier and earlier in the primary process. Uh, California? Yeah. <laughs> um, because Iowa takes their job very seriously. The people in Iowa take it very seriously. They know they're picking a president, a candidate, and they are um, very politically educated and they're involved. They come out, they come to these candidate forums and you really get to meet them. I love the process, by the way. I don't know how the rest of you feel about going to Iowa. I love, I love it. I mean, it's, it's, it's fabulous. The people are great, and you really feel like you're having a conversation with the voter. Right. The other thing that's really critical to me, and I don't, I, I, maybe this is how I'd want to change it after you do get elected, is you, you listen when you go. You hear what they're saying. You hear what they care about, what their concerns are. And, you know, I think maybe once you get in that office, you get so insulated and isolated, yeah. you lose the chance to really understand what people are thinking and hearing and feeling. And I've loved that part of it, is to feel it's hands-on. And Iowa's been critical that way, and New Hampshire as well. New Hampshire is very critical that way, because they're small enough states, you get out and you actually meet the voters. And you connect, Jerry, you wanted to say something? 
think we should stop the Jeopardy style debates and do Lincoln Douglas long format, really substantive, um, com you know, so you can depth, you can dive into the complexities of the issues that face us. I, I think it's absolutely critical that we start really having, you know, real conversations about the real issues that we have. And you cannot, on either side, you know, every two weeks, get up and have 30 second sound bites. When, when, how can you all know what we're, what anyone we thinks? All sound the same in 30 seconds. That's right. And I, I, I find, I just find it inc incredibly frustrating. I mean, from both sides. From both I, sides. I met with somebody who's made their life history studying first ladies and studying spouses and, and really researching the incredible lives of the women who have inhabited the White House. And he said to me, you know, I really think that for the American public to truly understand the role of the First Lady, a man's got to take that job. I, I don't agree. You don't agree? Listen, no, I don't think anybody up here agrees with that. No. Okay. <laughs> we, we right. notice he's not here at this forum. That's right. He's not here at this forum. We invited him to serve coffee, but he was busy. No. Um, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Um, and it was a man who said this, right? It was a man yeah. who said this. Katya Martin did not say that. No, she <laughs> didn't. Let me ask you, um, growing up myself in politics, having a dad who ran for president, vice president, and lost, it's a tough thing for a child to see their parent lose uh, in front of the country. Talk about grudges. Talk about hurt. Have you talked about that with your kids? Um, you've been through it. Um, do you worry about that? Do you talk about that ahead of time? I know nobody likes to talk about losing, but it's such a profound experience to go through as a child. And I, I'm, from a personal point of view, I was wondering if you had spoken to your kids about that. I, I think I have. I know my kids were younger when my husband ran um, against your uncle. <laughs> Great experience. No, just great. He yeah. taught us all we know. What? <laughs> he taught us everything we yeah. all know. Oh, good. Um, yeah. But but it's it's you you talk about it obviously we knew that was a long shot, Maria. So that's okay. No, we forgot to mention that. <laughs> um, but you you it, it, when my kids were younger, I mean we've won elections, we've lost elections, and obviously you you prefer to win them. But you talk about it's you know getting in the ring. That great Teddy Roosevelt quote of. Um, you know, who are you if you just don't get in the ring and get dirty and get muddy and, and f have fought the fight? And, you know, sometimes it's just getting in the ring that's important and not necessarily win or lose. You, you've got something to say, you feel it's important, and you just get in and you get bloodied. And um, for me, when my kids were going through that experience, that was what we talked about a lot, is that it's important that this week get involved in this process, this democratic process and things aren't always going to be how we would like them to be but everybody of course wants to win um, I have to say on election night in Massachusetts the next round I was the most stunned person in the room when it won I mean it feels it's a very different feeling yeah you know it's it's, yeah, it's it interesting is. how um, you, you kind of hold back your expectations and say prepare yourself for whatever happens and so in that realm of, of, of how you deal with that you you have to ex you know, having been both places, you just have to have the sense of reality of what can happen. But recognize that there's great value in having tried. And, you know, if we can teach our kids that, then maybe more people will become involved in politics. People are turning away from politics and not becoming involved. There's very good reason. I mean, it really is nasty and it's negative and it's tough and it's very tough on the families. So I think it's real important when you have small children and, you know, you got to let them know you, their daddy is a good guy. He's doing the good, he's doing the good fight. People are going to say things about them. It's not really what they're saying about him. Ignore that. I mean, it's hard to have yeah. a child understand that, yeah. that these uh, negative things that are coming their way, oh, is, is a reflection on their father or, you know, their spouse or whatever. It, it's, you've got to be able to teach children that there is a difference between um, how we treat people and how we should be, you know, we should then treat others as well. I mean, you, you, you got to let them know that it's, it's, their, their daddy is still really, really good <laughs> yeah. with all this you, going did on. Did you come across that in um, the last election? We, uh, honestly, we tried to tell the kids that this is not about a particular person. It doesn't mean that Jack is not 
you know, quoted by Ted Koppel as saying, you know, uh, Mr. Dumb, you know, referring to the, the president, and you have to have a little less, you know, conversation with him. That it's about the ideas, it's right. about the, the policies, and that you want to have, and if, the, I, the point is not so that your name is after the word president, it's so that your ideas become a reality. And, you know, honestly, I already feel some level of success. Not that I'm still not going to fight to make certain his name is after the word president, but I still feel uh, already that there have been successes. And we try to convey those as they happen. Uh, look, everybody has a universal health care plan now. You know, Daddy had one, now everybody does. Or environmental policy. And look, other people are doing the same thing. So you try to encourage them that there are successes in a process that sometimes is going to beat you down. And for them to see that it's it can't be ego driven if they attach too much to their father then they're they're not seeing the bigger picture of what you're trying to accomplish which is the real changes that you want and they think of it as some horse race and not the important job that it is in directing the country in one in one way or another fantastic okay well we're we're um, out of time uh, an hour goes like that you know, when you get five women, six women together. I want to thank these extraordinary women who really are public servants themselves. They honor us. Please give them your applause. Stand up. Women, come out here. You get out.